We continue our series through the Ten Commandments this afternoon, and we come now to the Second Commandment, and uh, I'll read Exodus 20, and I'll read uh, verses 1 through 6, but our text is verses 4 through 6. So let's give attention now to the reading of God's holy and inerrant inspired word from Exodus 20. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Thus far, God's holy word, may he bless to our hearts this afternoon. Uh, let's also turn in our Halberg Catechism now uh, to Lord's Day 35. Uh, you can find that in your Forms and Prayers book on page 243 page 243 in the Forms of Prayers book or in the song book on page 890. So Lord's Day 35, this is what we as a Reformed church believe and confess based on God's Word. And so let's read this together. I'll read the questions and let's respond together with the answers. What is God's will for us in the second commandment? That we in no way make any image of God nor worship Him in any other way than has been commanded in God's Word. May we then not make any image at all? God cannot and may not be visibly portrayed in any way. Although creatures may be portrayed, yet God forbids making or having such images in order to worship them or serve God through them. But may not images, as books for the unlearned, be permitted in churches? No, we should not try to be wiser than God. He wants the Christian community instructed by the living preaching of His Word, not by idols that cannot even talk. Well, E.W. Tozer once uh, said, what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And there's a lot of truth to that. But the question then is this. Is what comes into your mind an idol of your imagination? Or is it what you hear in God's own self-revelation of Himself in His Word? Um, That's what this second commandment is all about. It's about worshiping the right God in the right way according to His Word, as He's revealed Himself to us. And so, we'll get into that a little bit more in a moment, but we're continuing to work our way through the Ten Commandments. And just to remind you, last week we spent some time considering the first commandment, which says, you shall have no other gods before me. And uh, I think some people have a hard time distinguishing between the first and the second commandment here, Uh, And they're closely connected, uh, but they are to be distinguished. If the first commandment is about who we worship, the second commandment is about how we worship this one true God. In the first commandment, we are forbidden from worshiping any other God than the one true God. We would have no other gods but the God of the Bible, who has supremely revealed Himself in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Uh, and this second command then is that we're not only to worship the right God, but we're to worship Him in the right way. 
And how do we know the right way? Well, we don't just make it up. We don't just think, well, what would make me happy? I think I'll worship him like this. Or I like to think of God like this. No, we are to look to God's word to know how we're to worship him. And uh, so we'll consider that this afternoon. How are we to worship God? And uh, first we'll see that uh, Israel in the Old Testament was to worship God by faith and not by sight. In the Old Testament, God, worship, God was to be worshipped by faith and not by sight. And then when we come to the New Testament, we see that we still are to worship God in Christ by faith and not by sight. Uh, and I'll just add, in this age, and I'll explain that a little bit later. And then third, uh, just a brief point, we are to worship God according to His Word. Uh, but first, Israel was to worship God by faith, not sight. Uh, notice what this commandment specifically forbids. In verse 4, it says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. Uh, so clearly then this commandment forbids making carved images that represent the divine and using them for worship. Now, this commandment is not forbidding all artistic expression. It's not saying, children, that you cannot draw pictures of fish and uh, insects and uh, puppy dogs and birds. You can draw pictures of nature. Uh, we even see artist, you know, artistic um, carvings in the tabernacle and temple. Or, you know, the cherubim are embroidered on the curtains and there's other carvings of pomegranates and just things that make it make the Israelite uh, remember the Garden of Eden. Um, and so it's not forbidding all artistic expression, drawing stuff in the creation. Uh, God is not jealous of us having images of things that aren't meant to represent the divine. It's one thing to think about the sun and then draw the sun. It's another thing to think about God and then draw the sun to represent him or some other thing in creation. Um, even though the creation declares the glory of God, it is never to be confused with God the Creator who is always distinct from His creation. Deuteronomy 4 expands upon the second commandment and confirms this point when it says, Therefore, watch yourselves very carefully since, since you saw no form on the day that the Lord Yahweh spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire. Beware lest you act corruptly by making a carved image for yourselves in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the water under the earth. Uh, Israel was forbidden from making any of these images to represent God. And that's because they saw no form of God on Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, the emphasis is that God spoke to them. He spoke to them. And so they were to hear His Word and worship by faith and not by sight. They were to worship Him as He revealed Himself in His Word. And uh, the things Israel is to concern herself with is that which He's revealed in His Word. Deuteronomy 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So Israel worshiped God by faith. They were a people of the word. They heard God's law and covenantal worship, and by faith they worshiped the invisible God who spoke to them. Furthermore, they were called to instruct their children in the faith by teaching them God's law. Uh, the nature of the revelation determined how they would worship God and how they would pass on the faith to their children. And since God's revelation was verbal and not visual, they themselves were not to use pictures of God, either for worship or to teach their children with images of God. Rather, they were to teach them the Word of God and not adding or subtracting from the Word. Now, why is this so important? 
Well, the commandment itself gives us a reason. It says, because God is a jealous God. Now, often we think of the word jealous, and it's often sort of a negative thing, as we think a lot of, uh, you know, just humans, right? When we get jealous, uh, that doesn't often express itself in a good way. It's not always a good thing. Um, But this is an attribute of God, jealousy. God is jealous. He's a jealous God, and that's a good thing. This is a holy jealousy. It's not a sinful jealousy. And there is a kind of jealousy that is a good jealousy that humans can have. For instance, in a marriage relationship, it's good that a husband is jealous for his wife's faithfulness and that a wife is jealous for her husband's faithfulness within the covenant of marriage. And uh, that's a good thing. That's a good jealousy. Um, And remember, as we saw last week, that God's relationship with Israel is likened to that of a husband and a wife. They were his bride, and they were to remain faithful to him as their covenant Lord and to forsake all of their gods in love for him. But why did God forbid the making of images of himself in the second commandment? What is the logic behind this? Well, let's think about that a little bit. Uh, The first is that God is invisible and spiritual. He, he doesn't have a body like us. Um, sure, there's, uh, there's instances in the Bible where it describes, and we just sang it in Psalm 138, for instance, of having an outstretched arm and a mighty hand, but those are what we call anthropomorphis, anthropomorphisms. I don't know if I said that right. It's a big word, but these are basically like analogies to help us have any kind of understanding of some kind of finite understanding of God. John Calvin said it's like baby talk. You know, it's like baby talk. And uh, because he's so far beyond us and, and infinite that we would have no understanding of him unless he condescends to us in some way to reveal himself to us in ways that we can understand as finite creatures. And so he gives us analogies. It's, it's as if he has a hand or an arm, but he doesn't literally have a hand and arm like us. Jesus himself said in John four twenty four, God is spirit. God is spirit. And so to try to portray the divine nature in a finite man-made image is to dishonor the infinite God whose glory cannot be captured in a snapshot. It will always be a misrepresentation of the invisible, infinite, glorious, majestic God. You will never come close. You will just misrepresent who he is, and it won't be God. It will just be a false image, and and it would tell a lie. You'd be worshiping a false God. Uh, The second reason, the first is God is invisible and spiritual. The second reason is that we as fallen human beings are prone to idolatry, and thus even if images of God were harmless in themselves, we would tend to worship them because of our idolatrous sinful nature. A third reason is that there's a subtle, sinful desire to control God and to use Him for our purposes in making images of Him or statues of Him, uh, rather than allowing Him to be sovereign over us, right? When you have this image, you got this um, statue, it, it makes God so accessible, you know, and, and, you know, when you feel God's far from you, you just, you just pull him out of your pocket. Oh, he's right here. He's with me all along, right? And it, it really, you have control over God in a sense. He goes wherever you want to take him. And, um, and uh, this was the sinful impulse of Israel when they erected the golden calf. They were not happy with a God that they could not control. What's taking him so long? What's taking Moses so long? And so they made a golden calf to represent him so that they could worship him and access him on their own terms rather than on his terms. And so there's this subtle sinful desire to control God with the use of images and statues. Fourth, to make images of God was an implicit rejection of the sufficiency of God's verbal revelation and its proclamation. It doubts the sufficiency of that. God revealed himself by speaking to them, and that was to be sufficient for them, and they were to walk by faith according to his word. And and so in all of this is the underlying theme that God alone 
has the sovereign divine right to reveal himself to us when and how he wishes. And we are not to usurp his sovereign rights. As one theologian put it, God has exclusive rights to creating his own image, and it's a copyright that he will never surrender. But amazingly, there, in light of all that I've just said, there has been one creature in all of the creation to whom God has given his image. What creature is created in the image of God? Man and woman. Genesis 1, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And so, originally man was to reflect God's glory by living a righteous and holy life and to imitate the Creator who was so fruitful in creation and forming all the earth and, and filling it with all these creatures. So to man, creating the image of God with woman was to imitate God and be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and exercise dominion over the earth under God the Creator King. He was to rule as God's vice regent on earth under the authority of God who was king over it all. And in an unfallen world, humans would have reflected the divine image perfectly and they would have worshipped God alone. But this image was marred in the fall. And because of sin, man now worships his own image. And the images of birds and beasts and creeping things, as Paul says in Romans 1. And we all, in one way or another, as children of Adam who, have, uh, who are guilty and sinful in Adam, we all struggle with this. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And, and we all struggle with uh, keeping the second commandment and not creating a God in our own image. Uh, in general, this commandment is concerned with the purity of our worship, and no one worships God as perfectly, purely as they ought to. Even as Christians, we have to fight against our old sin nature that wants to worship God according to our own thoughts and imaginations. And so, we even will say to ourselves, or we'll hear others say this, you know, well, I like to think of God like this. You know, if this is how I like to think of God. Or I imagine that God is like this. And, and often, uh, the, the things that we say are often very much influenced by our culture, the idols of our culture. And so it's very common in many churches today and amongst professing Christians that, you know, the attribute that gets emphasized over and above every other attribute of God is what? Love, right? At the expense of His holiness and justice and jealousy and wrath and all these other attributes of God. Uh, and, and it's idolatrous. And, uh, and often we, but we, we, we tend to do that. We tend to think of God according to our own imagination or we're so easily influenced by our culture rather than digging deep into God's word and seeing who he, encountering the true living God. Uh, you might be, you know, coming up against an idol when you read God's word and you're put off by something in here about God. You ever have that experience? I'll admit it. Sometimes I read something, I'm like, whoa, that just kind of takes me back a second there as I read that. I have to remind myself, well, this is, this is the one true God. It's not who I invent in my imagination, and I need to submit to His Word. This is who God is, and, um, and I need to worship Him according to His Word. Uh, someone once said, in creation, God created man in His image, and ever since the fall, man has been returning the favor. And ain't that the truth? And so, thanks be to God that even though we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God and not, have not kept this commandment perfectly, in the fullness of time, God sent forth His own Son, His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, who was born under law and born of woman to redeem us from all of our sins and misery, to redeem us from the curse of the law. And, and Christ, as we see often, is the Lord and the servant of the covenant. And as the servant of the covenant, He takes our place as our representative, and He obeys this law perfectly in our place. He never sinned against this commandment. He always worshipped God according to His Word. And it was His delight, his, even His food, He says, to do His Father's will. He was always meditating on God's Word. He was always doing battle against the, 
the, the world and the temptations of Satan with the Word of God. Uh, he was the Word made flesh. He is the eternal Word of God in the flesh. And in that sense, He's also not just the servant of the covenant, but He's the Lord of the covenant as well. Uh, Colossians 1 says, He is the image of the invisible God. All right, we just heard all about how God is invisible. Well, He is the image of the invisible God. Hebrews 1 says, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. Uh, you want to see God, we, you behold Him in the face of Jesus Christ. Jesus said to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's significant. You know, Peter, uh, Philip just didn't quite get it yet. He's like, you keep talking about the Father, when are you going to show us the Father? He's like, you don't get it? You've seen me, you've seen the Father. We need to, we need to not make the same mistake as Philip did. You know, when we get to heaven, a lot of people think that they're going to see Jesus and then he's going to say, now let me show you the Father, you know. No, we see the Father in the face of Jesus Christ. And uh, He is the exact imprint of His nature. Colossians 2 says, For in Him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And so we still cannot make images of God because Christ came and fulfilled that role. Only Christ perfectly bears the image of God, and any man-made image will fall far short of God's glory revealed to us in Christ. Well, that brings us to a question of whether or not we are allowed to make images of Jesus then. And so let's uh, consider, secondly, that we are to worship God in Christ by faith, not by sight, in this age. Uh, one thing that is certainly different about the New Covenant in comparison with the Old is that in the New Covenant, God initially did reveal both His Word and His form in Christ, who delivered the New Covenant in person. Not through Moses, but in Christ, the Son of God. But while God revealed Himself in the incarnation of Christ, we need to come to terms with the fact that the New Testament over and over again characterizes this time between the first and second coming as a time in which we walk by faith and not by sight. Christ is no longer present with us in the flesh. At a particular point in redemptive history, he appeared for a time to the disciples. But in the opening chapter of the book of Acts, he ascended bodily into heaven. But even though Jesus would not be present with his church in the flesh, he would still be present. How would he be present? By the Spirit through the Word, not through pictures. And what did Christ commission His apostles to do specifically in His absence in Matthew 28? Was it to pass on a visual revelation of what He looked like or a verbal revelation? What well, was a verbal one? They, received both, they actually received both visual and verbal revelation as they saw Jesus, but He commanded them only to pass on His verbal revelation. In one theologian's words, the Spirit enabled them to produce inspired scriptures, not inspired pictures. Peter himself saw Jesus transfigured on the mountain, but he pointed God's people to the word of the prophets as the lamp in a dark place to which they should pay attention. And remember the opening chapter of 1 John, it says, that which was from the beginning which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. Notice once again the emphasis that they once saw Jesus, but now is the age of proclamation and not pictures. And again, this is over and over again in the New Testament. 2 Corinthians 5, so we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we're away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. 1 Peter 1, 
Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. You see, all throughout the New Testament, this age is characterized as walking by faith and not by sight. Like the Israelites, we are to hear God's Word and to worship by faith. We too are to teach God's Word to our children and to be content with the sufficiency of His Word. As our catechism puts it, but may not images as books for the unlearned, like those who can't read, be permitted in churches? This was often the objection during the time of the Reformation where there was many, much illiteracy and people couldn't read. Why can't we just like use pictures? We confess, no, we should not try to be wiser than God. He wants the Christian community instructed by the living preaching of His Word. Some translations put by the lively preaching of His Word. By an actual living person. Not by idols that cannot even talk. Now, not only did God give us His Word, He also gave us sacraments, didn't He? You see, not only do pictures of Jesus cast doubt upon the sufficiency of God's Word, they also diminish the sufficiency of the sacraments. In His mercy and grace, God has condescended to our weak faith, and He has given us God-ordained visible signs that are meant to nurture our faith when accompanied by the Word of God. He gave us water, He gave us bread, He gave us wine, but He didn't institute pictures of Himself. Furthermore, think about how in God's wisdom and providence, Christ came at a time when there weren't any cameras. You know, like we got today, smartphones and everybody, everybody's got a camera in their pocket, right? In God's providence, he didn't come in that day and age where there's cameras. And even though they could have drawn him, right? They had some forms of doing artwork and drawing. In God's providence, there is no picture of Christ to this day. There's no picture of Christ to this day. And the New Testament is actually, what's interesting too, is the New Testament is notably silent when it comes to descriptions of Jesus' physical appearance. Have you ever thought about that? There's like virtually nothing about his physical appearance described in the Bible. It doesn't tell us what color he had, what color, I'm sorry, what color hair he had, what color eyes he had, or how he was built. You would think that if God wanted us to make pictures of Jesus, that we would have been given some sort of preservation of His image, or at least a description in the Bible so that future generations could portray Him visually. But this is all notably absent from God's Word. And so whatever pictures that we come up with cannot accurately portray Him, because we don't even know what He looked like, which is why in many cultures, pictures of Jesus often take on the look of that ethnicity and are idolatrous. It's not even him. We don't even know what he looks like. It's just some random artistic expression of a dude. A random dude from that guy's imagination. And you see, a picture of Jesus presents us with a dilemma. At least I have a dilemma when I see a picture of Jesus. You know, people say we can make pictures of Jesus as long as we don't use them for worship. But then I think there's a dilemma. How then are we to respond to that picture? Here's the dilemma. Either we are to worship God through this man-made image from an artist who has no idea what Jesus looks like, or we refuse to worship through this man-made image and treat it as a common picture, thus rendering the picture useless and perhaps even wronging Christ for failing to have any response to a picture of him. It's like taking the Lord's name in vain, but a vain image. Uh, John Murray put it, put it well when he said it like this, a picture of Christ, if it serves any useful purpose, must evoke some thought or feeling respecting him. And in view of what he is, this thought or feeling will be worshipful. We cannot avoid making the picture a medium of worship. You just can't. And if you think you can, well, then it's just a vain image. (laughs) And also think about the fact that we too, like Israel, are in a covenant relationship with Christ that is like a marriage, right? 
Ephesians 5, the church is the bride of Christ. And think about this, you know, think about this. If I, you know, say like I went away for a year for some reason. I don't know. Uh, don't worry, I'm not going to go away for a year, Julie. But uh, just imagine, I go away for a year. For maybe a, a missionary or something. I've got to do some kind of mission work somewhere. And I bring a picture of, of my wife. And at some point, you know, so I can remember her because I'm going to miss her. And imagine if I lose that picture. And, but I really miss seeing a picture of my wife. And so I find a picture of some other woman. And I say, well, I'll just use this and pretend like this is my wife, Julie. And other people say, do you have a picture of your wife I could see? Oh, yeah, here she is. This is my wife. How do you think she's going to feel about that? You know, like, she's going to be rightly, she's going to have a holy jealousy. Right? Right? And that's, how is that really any different when we are married to Christ? He's the bridegroom. We're his bride, the church, and we're carrying all these, like, pictures of another man that's not him and telling people this is Jesus. Right? It's not he jealous? Is not his name jealous? And so, for all these reasons, I think we, this commandment teaches that we are to avoid pictures of Jesus. Um, now, that said, there's nothing wrong with wanting to see Jesus. There's nothing wrong with wanting to see Jesus. This is our, we could, here's another big word, es, this is our eschatological hope. This is our hope, our blessed hope, that one day we will see Jesus at the end of time when he returns. And, and that's a good thing to want to see Jesus. And that's why we walk by faith, not by sight in this age, but when he returns, then we will see him and worship him and we will glory in his presence. And this is what the New Testament also holds out for us, that this is that while this is the time of walking by, by faith, one day we're going to see Jesus, and this is our great hope. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 1, when he comes on that day, he will be glorified in his saints and be marveled at among all who have believed. John says that we will see him face to face and be like him. Revelation 22 says that the new heaven and new earth will come down out of heaven from God and then they will see his face. That's our glorious hope. You can think of it kind of like a wedding day. Now, I know, you know, nowadays it's sort of, I think, maybe 50 50 on whether or not the bride and groom see each other before the wedding ceremony. But there was a time where that was quite rare, I think, you know, where you don't see your, your spouse until it's the moment. And uh, what a glorious moment that is when you see your spouse. If you hadn't seen them on the wedding day yet, and all decked out, and it's a wonderful thing. And uh, when we try to see Jesus now, we are robbing ourselves of the joy that awaits us. We're diminishing that. We're, we're sort of spoiling the surprise, and it's not really a true image anyway. Um, but it's, it is going to be a glorious day, and that is our hope, and that's a good thing to want to see Jesus on that great wedding day, the wed at the wedding supper of the Lamb. And so until then, we wait patiently. We walk by faith and not by sight, and we receive with gratitude Christ's presence in the Word and sacraments. And the Spirit powerfully works through these God-ordained means for us and for our children. So how are we to worship God? We are to worship God in Christ by faith and not by sight in this age. And the more general application of this commandment is that we are to worship God according to His Word. And this is a third just brief point that we are to worship God according to His Word. We confess in the Catechism that we in no way are to make any image of God nor worship Him in any other way than He has commanded us in His Word. Uh, many today believe that worship is just a matter of personal preference. You worship God your way and I'll worship God my way. And uh, many don't think to ask, how does God want to be worshipped? How does God want to be worshipped? What is His way? And people think it doesn't, it doesn't matter as long as you're sincere, as long as it comes from the heart. Well, sincerity is certainly important. You know, God is not happy when people worship 
him with their lips, but their hearts are far from me, as he says. We are to worship sincerely and from the heart. But God is also jealous that we worship not only from the heart, but that we worship in truth, according to his word. He's jealous of that as well. One example of this is, if you recall the golden calf incident in Exodus 32, where uh, Israel you know, provokes God to wrath, and he's ready to just judge them all. Uh, but then Moses steps in as a mediator. Um, that was, a viol- was that a violation of the first commandment or the second commandment? Well, really kind of both, but technically it's especially a violation of the second commandment. Because if you remember, when the golden calf is presented to Israel, it's presented as, this is the God who brought you out of Egypt. This is the God who brought you out of Egypt, and then they were going to have a feast to Yahweh. So it's not like they were, worship, it's not like they were saying, we're going to worship Baal and use a golden calf. They were saying, we're going to worship Yahweh and use a golden calf. And that's why God was so upset, because they, even though they might have been worshiping the right God, they were worshiping Him in the wrong way. They weren't worshiping Him according to His Word. And so God was going to pour out his wrath on them, but thankfully Moses mediated. Another example of where we see in the Bible where God is jealous that we worship him according to what he has commanded in his word is the case of Nadab and Abihu. You may remember that little story in Leviticus 10 uh, where it says, now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered un authorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. A lot of people today think it's, you could worship God however you want as long as it's not forbidden, whatever you're doing. But what we say here, according to God's word, is it's not just about you know, avoiding what's forbidden, but also we want to be careful just to worship Him the way He commands us, positively to worship Him. And that's the emphasis in Leviticus 10. They worshiped, they offered unauthorized fire, which He had not commanded them. There's nowhere where it forbade them from doing this, but He's upset because they did what He did not command them to do. Uh, One last passage, Deuteronomy 12 warns Israel as they enter the land of Canaan um, to not worship him like the pagans worshiped their gods. Deuteronomy 12 says, take care that you be not ensnared to follow them after they have been destroyed before you and that you do not inquire about their gods saying, how did these nations serve their gods that I also may do the same? You shall not worship Yahweh your God in that way. You see, not only was Israel forbidden from worshiping the counterfeit gods of the Canaanites, they were also forbidden from worshiping the one true God falsely in that way. And God added this warning, see that you do all I command you. Do not add to it or take away from it. And when we come to the New Testament, we see that God still is jealous for his glory in worship and that we offer what he calls acceptable worship. As we heard in our call to worship in Hebrews 12, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's still a jealous God. He's still a consuming fire. Well, how do we, that begs the question, how do we know what's acceptable to God in worship? Well, we look, we look to his word. Uh, I often think to myself of, uh, you know, like maybe a you know, when somebody has a baby these days, they often will, you know, register somewhere. Or if they have a wedding, they'll register somewhere. And so it's like you ask yourself, well, how will I know what they might want? Well, duh, just look at the registry and just buy, stick to the registry, you know? You, you know they're going to like it. They asked for it. And uh, that's why I'm a big fan. of just like to stick to the registry, you know? Um, I know that they're going to like it. If they don't like it, then it's the manufacturer's fault, right? Um, but they can't blame me. 
They told me what they wanted. I gave them that. Um, in a similar way, how do we know what's acceptable to God in worship? Well, we don't just try to make it up. He hasn't left us to ourselves to do that. He's revealed what he desires, what he delights in in his word. And so the Reformed have often talked about elements of worship. Uh, and that is, if you look at one of our liturgies for the morning or afternoon service, you look at each little element listed there, and we would say that those are things that we can find in God's word that are pleasing to him. And uh, so, for example, uh, Reformed churches include the following elements in their worship services based on God's word. The, the reading of scripture. I'm pretty sure God is okay with us reading his scripture in worship. That's Acts 15 and Revelation 1. Uh, the preaching of the Word of God, 2 Timothy 4. The hearing of the Word of God, James 1. Prayer, Acts 2. The singing of psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, Colossians 3, Ephesians 5. Baptism, Matthew 28. The Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11 and Acts 2. The collection of offerings, Galatians 2 and 1 Corinthians 9. We see these things in God's Word, that He's pleased with these elements. Some, stuff, some things we don't see in God's Word is skits and dramas and videos and all kinds of other things we might come up with. But we stick to what we see in God's Word. And this, to some people, thinks so restrictive, but no, actually this is meant to give us liberty and freedom of conscience when we worship God. We don't have to be worried like, is this, you know, like a Nadab and Abihu moment here as I do this? I don't know if he likes this. No, you can know and trust that this is in God's Word and He delights in it, so you can worship Him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. It frees up the conscience of the worshiper to worship Him. And we order these elements in what we call a covenant dialogue, which is also a pattern we see in the Bible, that God speaks to His people and His people respond. And so this is just briefly a little bit about how we are to worship God according to His Word in corporate worship. And, uh, but the second commandment is especially concerned with not just worshiping the right God, but worship him, worshiping Him the right way according to His Word. We walk by faith and not by sight. And no doubt we all fall short of worshiping God as purely as we ought. None of us does this perfect, but we are thankful that Christ is our mediator, our Savior, who has lived a perfect life, died for all of our sins. And as we are washed in His blood and clothed in His righteousness, through faith, as a gift of free grace, we can enter into worship with confidence and assurance through His merits. And this is what Hebrews 10 says, and with this I'll end, it says in Hebrews 10, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for He who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near, the day when you will see Christ face to face. Amen. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word, and we pray that you, you would write it on our hearts and that it would be sufficient for us, as You've promised it is, uh, perfect and complete, that the man of God may be equipped for every good work. And so help us to walk by faith in this age, to be deeply rooted in Your Word, and to worship You according to it. And we pray that we would be people who proclaim Your Word to others and share the hope within us, and also teach it to our children and our children's children, and that you would bless that. And uh, we pray that you'd forgive us of our sins, and that you would uh, remind us always that we are uh, clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and that he is our, our Savior, uh, and he's the only Savior we need. He is sufficient uh, to save us from all of our sins. And we look forward to seeing Him face to face. We pray, Lord Jesus, quickly come. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.